for those of you who don't know me, I'm Dr. Tech on CPAN. Uh, can you all see the slides or should I turn the lights off? Yeah? Okay, well, let me know as we go. Uh, I have written a bunch of Elasticsearch modules and spoken about them in the last previous YAPSIs, and today I'm talking about Elastic Model, which is a kind of DBIX equivalent of, uh, for Elasticsearch and Moose, but we'll come to that. Do you ever wake up in the morning and you think to yourself, I have an idea for a killer app? <laughs> How do you begin to design it? You start by designing your objects, then you need to store them in the database. So you break them into little pieces, flatten them out, and put them into Postgres or MySQL. You make sure the data is normalized, you add some indexes to make sure that it's fast. Of course, you need to add some tables to handle many to one relationships and more indexes for those. And we probably need some full text search. Okay, so let's copy the data over to a full text search engine and then make sure that we keep the two in sync. Right, ready to go. Uh, oh, how do we get the objects? Right, pull back the search results. They've got an object ID. Then we can hit the database and pull the objects and perhaps the objects are in a cache, inflate. Okay, anyway, we get it all sorted out. We go live and it's marvelous success. Brilliant success. It, too successful. Uh, we need to learn to, uh, how to scale. But we have a plan. We buy a bigger box. Perhaps the indexes need some tuning, a few things were missed out. Uh, we add some caching, and then we fix the caching bugs. <laughs> add some master-slave replication, and fortunately, masters and slaves never go out of sync, so that's all right. <laughs> buy some SSDs, which give us a nice boost for a while. Eventually, you end up denormalizing a lot of data because there are a bunch of common queries that you run, and doing those joins is just too damn expensive. Buy some bigger boxes, and then you get to a point where you can't buy any bigger boxes, and you have to shard your data. And by sharding, I mean you break it up into manageable chunks that where each chunk can fit onto a single computer, and you need to somehow be able to uh, query this sharded data, get all the data back, merge it together, and make some sense out of it which really means rewriting your application. The question you've got to ask yourself is, do you really need a relational database? And this is the same question that the people who started NoSQL asked themselves. They looked at what the relational databases provided, and it, you know, they're fantastic, but are, are all their requirements needed for the kind of applications that we're doing? And the answer is probably no. And so they came up with NoSQL, and NoSQL uh, databases have a number of advantages. They tend to be document oriented So rather than you having to map your object into some flat storage like, that looks like a spreadsheet, you just store it. It's, they're typically optimized for fast reads and writes. And they can scale horizontally, which means if you double the number of, of servers you've got running this thing, you should get double the scale, and something which is not true of databases without a lot of work. They sh of course, with all these extra nodes, you are likely to have a few of them failing every now and again, so they should be able to recover from that. Uh, so all that's great, but there are differences from relational databases, and they are differences that you need to be aware of when you're uh, writing your application. For instance, there are no transactions. So you can put in a single doc, but you can't lock stuff and update several docs and roll it back. It just doesn't happen. There are no joins. But then if you've already sharded your database, you can't do distributed joins performantly anyway. So build your application to work with that. All your data is denormalized. You're not, there are no relationships. So you essentially have a list of documents. You put a filter in front of it, and you filter out the documents that you want, and that's your result set which is quite different from how a relational DB would work. You still need to add indexes, and you still need to add full text search. And this is where Elasticsearch comes in. And quite a few of you have heard of it, but let me tell you a bit about it. Elasticsearch, it's a Lucene-based uh, product, much like Solar, but knocks the socks off Solar. It's a real-time document store. By real-time, I mean that as soon as you index a document, it is available to be retrieved by any other uh, node in the, in the system. It's a powerful, powerful full-text search engine. If any of you have used Lucene and Solo, you have an idea of uh, how flexible and powerful it is. It's got near real-time visible search results. 
So it's not instantaneous. When you index a doc, it's not visible immediately, but within a second, it becomes visible to search, which is, so that's different from real-time CRUD, okay? And clearly, this is something you need to be aware of when designing it, because you might add, an, add a comment to your database, uh, send the user back and query the comments, and it's not there, but a second later it is. So you code around that. It's got the usual filters, geolocation functionality, and so on that you, you would expect from a full feature, feature database, and it's distributed by design. So I can just start five uh, servers with Elasticsearch on them. They'll discover each other and start talking to each other. And all of the complexity of querying a distributed system and merging that data back, to, back together is handled by, by Elasticsearch and doesn't need to be handled by your application. It's fault tolerant. So if one of those five nodes goes down, it'll detect that and just rebalance the cluster and carry on running. I, I went off to uh, Mexico for a couple of weeks and came back and found that one of our nodes had gone down and nobody noticed. It just, no, you know, <laughs> everything kept running. <laughs> uh, it gives you really easy and flexible sharding in a way that you can write your application once and forget about it. It's not that you have to revisit the whole concept later on. You can start small with it and scale massively. There are people running hundreds of billions of docs with Elasticsearch, and there are people with, you know, running on half a gig VMs, which isn't recommended, but it's doable. <laughs> so why try to keep two data stores in sync? Just use Elasticsearch, both for your storage and uh, your querying, and you can do it in Perl with Elastic Model. This is the module that I, I released a, a few weeks ago, and it's, it's got its first user, Diego, <laughs> besides ourselves. Um, uh, so it's, it's early days, but it, it seems to be working out well. The idea is that you can store and query your Moose objects in Elasticsearch. I'm trying not to cover up anything in Elasticsearch. It, it exposes the full power. Your, everything that Elasticsearch can do, you can do through the module or around the module, but without too much extra work. But it does take care of all the housekeeping for you, the annoying stuff that we'd rather forget about. So how do we go about using it? Let's start with a, a simple blog post. Can you see this? Too small. OK, I'll re it's very simple. The rest of the code's bigger, but <laughs> this didn't fit. It's a simple Moose class. Uh, I've got a title attribute here, which is a string, content, which is a string, and a created date, OK, which is a date time. And then we want to allow multiple users to create posts here. So we'll create a user class, which has got a name attribute, also a string, email, also a string. And we'd like the posts we'd like the post to be owned by a user. So we'll add a user attribute here, and the is a constraint is my app user, okay? So to add the elastic model magic, the, the only thing you need to do to convert this into a class suitable for storing in Elasticsearch is to change use moose to use elastic doc. There's a bunch of other stuff you can do, but that's all you need for, the, for now. Right, we need to pause for a moment and talk about some definitions because there are a bunch of terms that we use that um, either you won't know or sound different from what you're used to. So let's start with uh, some Elasticsearch terms. An index in Elasticsearch is like a database in MySQL or Postgres, okay? So you can have multiple databases, multiple indices. A type is the equivalent of a table in that database, a doc, is like a row in the table, and an alias is like a symbolic link which points to one or more indices. This is quite important and becomes, uh, uh, it becomes more obvious later on why. Elastic model also has uh, some terminology of its own. A domain is an index or an alias. So you, wherever you see a domain, you can use either an index directly or an alias which points at one or more indices. A namespace has a type class mapping for all of the domains associated with that, and you'll see an example now. And the model is the thing that connects your app to an instance of Elasticsearch. Okay, so we need a model. It's called my app, it uses Elastic Model, 
and we need to define at least one namespace. You can define multiple, but we're going to start with the namespace my app. And we're saying that my app user will be stored in the user type and my app post in the post type. OK, so it's like a table class mapping. That's our model defined. And we get to use it, uh, use it. <laughs> Create an instance of it. And I'm not specifying an Elasticsearch cluster, so it just connects to local host. Uh, but really, to do anything useful, we need one of three handles. Okay? The first is a namespace object, which we use for index and alias management, a domain, which we use for document CRUD. So anything that's getting and setting, updating documents by ID, that's what you use. And for searches, you use a view. And we're going to have a look at, at some of the API to show a few uh, kind of how it works to get you a feeling, uh, give you a feeling for uh, the code. We can create an index by calling namespace index create. We haven't specified an index name here, so it takes the namespace name, which means we've created index my app. And remember, I said that the type class mapping in namespaces was for all domains associated with that namespace. But currently, namespace my app points to the single index my app. OK, to delete an index, pretty simple. And now we're going to create an alias that's pointing to a new index my app version 1. Again, we don't, we don't specify an alias name here, so that's my app. So what we're saying is that we have created alias my app, which points to index my app version one, which means that namespace my app points to alias my app, points to index my app version one. Okay, so my app version one, the type class mapping is controlled by the same namespace my app. To create a user, we need a domain object. And you, you would just call new doc, the, the type of object you want to create, and the arguments that would, you would normally pass to new. And once you have it, you can save the object. Uh, you could do that all in one step using create. Now, you notice I haven't specified an ID here. Uh, and you can do, but if you don't, you'll get an auto-generated ID. So here, we, we do specify an ID, and we can access the ID and type data through the object itself. Creating a post is exactly the same thing. And the only interesting part here is that we are passing the user object that we've just created uh, into this and saving that. That will create a reference to that object and save it in Elasticsearch. So you do get some kind of, in your object model, you can have relations. Uh, and how that's indexed will come to a bit later on. To retrieve a doc, you just call get the uh, type and the ID. Now, the user that belonged to the post, uh, we can retrieve through the post object. At this stage, we've asked for it, and it creates the stub object. It doesn't actually get it from the database. And the stub object has some information like ID in it. But as soon as we need to use the, the user in, in properly, uh, it fetches the data from Elasticsearch and inflates it into the proper object. To update a doc, well, change something, Elastic model keeps track of whether the object has changed, whether a particular attribute has changed, and the original value of that attribute. And once you're done, you save it, and all hunky-dory. Elasticsearch uses optimistic version control. Uh, Anybody know what that is, not know what that is? OK, well, in most databases, you use pessimistic uh, version control. So you lock everything that you're going to change, make the changes, unlock it. Uh, optimistic assumes that actually we probably won't have concurrency problems, but then provides a mechanism for detecting them if they are. And that mechanism is a version number, which gets incremented on every change. Uh, so if you have two processes working in parallel. They both get the same document. Uh, they both change it. The first one saves it successfully. The second one saves it, and you get a conflict error. So we have two ways of dealing with this. The first is to ignore them. Instead of 
uh, and this is what most people do today in, a, in any database. Oh, look, it's changed, never mind. <laughs> Instead of calling save, you would call overwrite. But we also provide an on-conflict handler, which allows you to do more interesting things depending on the context. And in the conflict handler, you, it gets called with the object you're trying to save and the object that is newer and exists in Elasticsearch. And then you could do something, uh, whether it's informing the user or mm, throwing an error or whatever it is you want to do, you can do it here and continue with your code. So here's a simple example where all I'm doing is updating the new object with just the attributes that have changed in the old object and trying to save it again. To query docs, you use a view. And a view is a bit like a prepared search. It doesn't hit the database until you actually call search or uh, three or four other methods on that. You can reuse views. Uh, so we create a posts view, which is a view, a view of documents of type post. And then from the posts view, we can uh, add a filter, which is uh, only documents of type post that are featured. So the posts view and the featured view both exist. They are different and can be used and reused uh, for searches. You c they can cross a single domain or multiple domains and a single type or multiple types. So remember what I said about this sort of long stream of documents and you're just filtering? That, that's how it works. If you, if you just want to hit one index, you can. If you want to hit lots of them, you can do that too. Uh, I, this is an example of a, a view, and I'm not gonna go into a huge amount of detail. Uh, last year, I did a talk called Terms of Endearment at the CIAPSI, uh, which explains a lot about the query language of Elasticsearch, which is a talk in its own, so I won't get into it. But just to give you a feeling for what you can do here, creating a view on a single domain, limited to type uh, documents of type post. We can add a filter where documents must have been created since the beginning of August, uh, belonging to this user, and where the title contains the words awesome. We're gonna sort it by the timestamp, uh, maximum of 20 documents, highlight snippets in the content, and we're still developing, so we'd like some debugging information. Okay, so this is the kind of a typical query that you could create. Uh, to get results, you need to call a method on the view. Uh, a method could be first, which gives you the first result, uh, search, which gives you 10 by default results, but it's a bounded list, a maximum of 10. And you can get unbounded results using scroll and scan. And the difference between that is explained in the documentation. The results are iterators. So you can move through them or you can use shift to pull the next one off the list and, and discard it. A result, which is what the results iterator returns when you call next, consists of search metadata and the object. It actually contains the object already. There's no separate fetch step that you have to go hit the database again. You've got it all there ready to use. Uh, so I, I can access the object by going result, object, and then whatever attribute I want to use. A typical kind of loop would be we perform our search, we can get the total hits, how long it took, and then step through each result returning the title attribute from the object, uh, highlighted snippets from the content field, uh, the relevant score, and the de debugging information. Pretty simple. Sometimes you don't want the, the search metadata, you just want the objects themselves. For instance, give me all posts by this user because I want to display a list, okay? In which case, you can ask for the next object instead of just next. Or if you want a whole bunch of them, you can switch the iterator to just give you objects, or just give you results, or just give you the raw data from Elasticsearch. It's time to do some more interesting stuff. Elasticsearch is not just a doc store. It's a really powerful search engine. But you can only get out what you put in, okay? So configuring it is important. You need to prepare your data properly. You need to tell it what fields you've got, 
what data they contain, and how you want them indexed. Fortunately, uh, sorry, it's called mapping, which is like a database schema in the normal DB. Fortunately, Moose gives us introspection, which takes a lot of this pain away. We start off with a simple attribute, name is a string, and the type constraint is the thing that allows us to determine index types and how the default way of how we index a field. So this, this would be the equivalent mapping in Elasticsearch, and this means this is a string, we are going to analyze it like full text and make it searchable like full text. Perhaps we, want, we know that our documents contain English and we want to uh, optimize the analysis for English or Norwegian. Or we don't want the fields analyzed at all, in which case, like a postcode or a tag, in which case it stores exactly the value that you have passed in. You can store structured documents, nested documents, arrays, geolocation points, moose classes. You, if there's something that isn't supported, it's easy to write a, a mm, kind of type map handler that will support it. Um, elastic, you can store other elastic doc classes, or at least links to them, like we did with the post and the user. And all that's required here is that you specify the elastic doc class that you want to store. It creates quite a com complicated mapping. The UID is the bit that links uh, the document uh, uh, to, the original, uh, to where the original document is stored. But you notice that it's also stored the name and email attributes, essentially giving you denormalized data. So this will allow you to search for posts by a user whose name is John, where before you'd have to find users whose name was John and then search for posts that have that ID in them. Perhaps you don't want all of, uh, all of the attributes in there, in which case you can configure which attributes you want included. The UID is always included, otherwise you lose the link. Sometimes you use the same data for a different purpose. We've got a title on Amazing Talk. Thanks. Uh, <laughs> That would get analyzed to the two tokens amazing talk, okay? Amazing and talk. It drops and because it's a stop word. But now you want to sort on the title field. So what do you sort on? It's a multi-value field and you can't sort on those because mm, you, you, you would be choosing one at random. Okay, and this, for this we use multi-fields which allows us to index the same data in different ways for different purposes. So we change this to a multi-field by adding multi, the field name, which is untouched, and the mapping for that field. So we, we, we want that to be passed through unchanged. Now when we index an amazing talk, we have two versions, title and untouched. The title has the original full text analysis, and untouched is exactly the same. How about doing some autocomplete? Everybody always wants to know how to do autocomplete, and they think that wildcards are the way, but they're not. They really are not. They're slow and inefficient. The right way to do it is to prepare, prepare your data properly, and we're going to analyze it using edge n-grams. So an n-gram is a kind of window moving across a word. An n-gram of one would mean first letter, second letter, third letter, fourth letter. An n-gram of two would be first and second, second and third, third and fourth. It, an edge n-gram is the same idea, but anchored to the start of a word. Okay, so we have first, first second, first second, third. You'll see how it works. We, uh, in the analysis process, let's start with ADPF. It goes through a tokenizer, which would break it into two words. Goes through a lowercase token filter, which lowercases it. ASCII folding token filter, which removes the accent on the E. And finally, our edge n-grams token filter, which breaks it up into all of these tokens, which is perfect for partial matching. To implement this in Elasticsearch, we need to configure this analyzer and the, to the edge n-grams token filter. So we go to our model, and we add has filter my edge n-grams. It's a type edge n-grams, which is a built-in type, and we're configuring it by saying we want everything from 1 to 15 characters. Okay? We add an analyzer called autocomplete, 
which uses the standard tokenizer, the built-in lowercase ASCII folding filters, and our custom filter. Now we need to specify it in our doc class. We're going to add a second multi-field here called autocomplete, which uses our autocomplete analyzer. Right, we're ready to go. Oh, right, sorry, more slides. So that's what it would produce when we index the same values. Now we need to apply our changes. We've, our mapping is old, and the data in the index uses the previous mapping. So we've got to update the mapping and the data. And the way we do that is by re-indexing to a new index. With the new index will be my app version 2. And we create it and fill it up with data by calling re-index everything from the domain my app. My app currently points to my app version 1. Okay. We update uh, the namespace my app to now point to my app version 2. And we can delete the old index. That's the re-indexing process. So we now need to query the data. And it gets a bit tricky. Here's a, a simple query. And we're going to start with querying the title.autocomplete method with amazing tar. Unfortunately, it also matches anything that starts with A or T. So we need to work on this a little. This query is, was just a shortened form of a text query where the query is amazing talk. And it turns out that the operator for a text query is, the, the default operator is OR, which means that this is what it's really querying. If we change that to AND, suddenly this query works. We're getting the right results. Let's tweak it a bit further. Uh, perhaps complete words like amazing should be considered more relevant than incomplete words. So we'll add a query against the title field, which remember just contains the tokens amazing and talk. And amazing will match. Currently, if, you, if any of you are familiar with SQL abstract, it uses a similar kind of notation. This would, these two uh, clauses would be combined uh, with AND. But if we wrap them in square brackets, they would be combined with OR. What that means for a query is that if, w if one of these matches, uh, or how do I say this? If both of the clauses match, the document would be considered more relevant than if just one of the clauses match. OK, we're done. Our autocomplete query now works, and you can go out and use it. I'm coming to the last part of my slide. How am I doing for time? <laughs> uh, scaling. And th this is where Elasticsearch really shines, and where the topic of the talk comes from. So I'm rather glad that I managed to get here. <laughs> There's a basic unit of scale in Elasticsearch, which is the shard. And the shard, a shard is a single Lucene instance. And it doesn't matter if you don't know what that means, because it just means that one shard is the minimum thing that you can have in Elasticsearch and have it functioning. Uh, we talked about indexes. And an index contains one or more primary shards. Each primary shard can have zero or more replica shards, which are exact copies of the primary shard. And they're copies that can be promoted to primary shards if the primary shard disappears. The more primaries you have, the more total data you can store. While replicas are used for failover and to scale the number of queries that you can perform. OK. By default, an index will be created with five primary shards with one replica each. And if you start one node, you will get the five primary shards up and running. If you start two nodes, it'll bring up the five replicas. If you start three nodes, it'll reorganize them to balance out the cluster. This means that you have a total of 10 shards from when you create a default index, which means that you can scale to up to 10 servers with just the default settings in Elasticsearch. Now, 10 servers of data is quite a lot, but there are obviously uh, uh, websites that are a lot bigger than that. You can change the number of replicas, but you can't change the number of primaries. So the question is, how do we scale? 
How do we make sure that we, how do we future proof our application? And this is the first thing everybody thinks of. I will create a kajillion shards and run it on my laptop. Well, no, unfortunately, because <laughs> see, he agrees. <laughs> Be a grower, not a shower. The, <laughs> the each shard has a cost in CPU and memory. It's not huge, but if you're going to run 10,000 of them on a, on a single box, you'll have problems. So it's not, it's not the answer. The answer comes from the convenient fact that at query time, when you're querying your indexes, querying one index with 10 shards is exactly equivalent to querying 10, 10 indices with one shard. Okay, so an index is just a nice way of grouping a bunch of data, but you can query however many shards you like in the process and it's, it all works. So the two patterns that are commonly used for scaling like this, time-based indices and index per user. The, the typical application for a time-based index would be storing logs. So let's have decide one index per month or per week or per day. Uh, we can start off with one shard in the index. Perhaps in the future, each month needs five shards. But we can make those decisions as we go. We're going to write to the alias logs current, and our queries will be to the alias logs. Okay? So the logs current will always point to the current month, and logs will point to all months. We get our namespace logs, create an index for the current month, uh, we alias logs current to the, current, uh, the newly created index, and we also add the new index to the logs alias. Okay, now we can write to the logs current domain and we can query the logs view. We can also query the logs current domain, but that would only give us for this month, uh, while logs will give us for all time. New month, new index. Create uh, one for September. We update the logs current alias to point to September. And notice that I added here rather than using two because I wanted to point to what it points to currently, plus logs 2012.09, okay? We could add other aliases, like logs 2012, which gives us all the indices just for this year, or for the last three months, or whatever. When you're done with it, you can just drop the, uh, the old indices. Or you could close the index, which would mean you'd still have the data, but it's not using up resources in your cluster. And if you really needed it, you can open it up again. Index per user. Typically, uh, now a user might be um, a mail group, a mailing group, or a client who wants a website, or whatever, whatever it is, however you classify a user. Typically, users have their own data, and most searches are per user. So the ideal thing would be just to have an index per user. But we know that this is expensive CPU and RAM wise, so we need to be a bit clever about it. The problem is most users have very little data. So having their own, their own index for that is a waste. And of course, some have lots of data. You need to be able to handle both of these. But we'll start with one index for all users. And we're going to use aliases to pretend that we have one index per user. And these are aliases you haven't seen so far. They've got filters and routing on them. I'm creating an alias blogs plumber which points to the index myat version one. All queries will have this filter automatically added that the client ID must be blogs plumbers. So we can separate out just this client's docs. And we set this routing value to blogs plumbers as well, the client name. Routing determines which shard your doc lives on. And it's normally derived from the ID of the document. Uh, so you call it ID 1, it may go to shard 1. ID 2 goes to shard 4, and this is how it balances it out. But we're setting the routing to a particular value, which means that all the data for this, this user is stored in the same shard. It also means that our CRUD hits only one shard, and all of our queries for this user hit only one shard. So it's really efficient. 
new client comes along, and uh, six months later, we realize we need to give them a little more space. The one shard isn't, it just isn't doing it for them. So we put them in their own index. They, they deserve their own index. And the index will be called Twitter version one. We create it by re-indexing from the alias Twitter. So it pulls all the data out of uh, our current space and sticks it into Twitter version one. We update the alias Twitter to point to the new index. And of course we add it to the overall namespace and we're done. We, we've now successfully migrated a, a, a big user into their own index. How does the data from one index go into the number, like before from version one to version two? Uh, uh, it gets read in and re-indexed. But how does it, it know which kind of data to use? Only, only the, the Twitter data and everything? Oh, because, because it, uh, the, the Twitter alias, whoop, the Twitter alias uh, has got that filter on it. So it'll just give you stuff that, that's got client ID Twitter. Uh, and that's it. You have uh, the ability to scale very easily. And that's the end of my talk. Thank you. <laughs> Any, any questions? No. So the question is, if you have, like the post and user object, if I were to change the user object, would the, po the name indexed in the post object be updated? And the answer is no. You would have to update that, and that would, probably the best way of doing that is to have a trigger that says, we need to do this thing and do it in the background. Because you, you don't know how many docs you might have. It might be one, two, it might be a million. So you need to manually Yeah. 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 Um, I mean, it's, it's possible that we could add um, some kind of trigger that would do it automatically, but I'm, I'm wary about over-automating it because there's so many use cases. Yeah. You actually have to tell Elasticsearch about that so that it can then get indexed. Otherwise, it would just not retrieve those attributes. So if you, ch if you change your mapping, then you need to re-index. You can add to mapping without uh, re-indexing. But if you change any existing value, then the data in the database is wrong. You need to re-index. Okay? Uh, so you, you can re-index as I've shown. And you can also uh, pass, if you're, let's say for instance, you're changing a tag field to a tags attribute and you want to change it from a scalar or a string to an array of strings. You can pass a, a transform callback which allows you to update those values automatically, uh, or, you know, transform each doc as it goes so that it's got the right format in the, the new version. Yeah? Multi-search, as in multiple searches at once. Sorry? Uh, oh, bulk inserts. You can. Uh, I don't currently expose that here because I'm, I haven't figured it out yet, but you definitely can. And in fact, the re-index process uses bulk insert. Uh, and it's about 10 times as fast as normal indexing. Uh, I, I need to figure out where it's appropriate to use uh, in Elastic Model. There may be things like you can create loads of logs and have a kind of up, a delayed save, and then you call a flush every so often that triggers a, a save. So yeah, it's early days and I'm open to ideas. <laughs> Anybody else? Do you need to have all the, the cluster nodes in the same network? Yes, so it, it's, it, the distributed data centers is not well supported yet. Um, it, the nodes need to talk to each other. So if you have a bit of network outage, it's quite possible that one will disappear and will change a cluster. Uh, one of the things they're working on is a changes stream, which will allow you to replicate between data centers. And we're out of time. But uh, any questions you want to ask, please come up. Thank you.